Uh, everybody, welcome uh, the, to our next edition of Discussion with the Pros. We have the privilege and honor today of welcoming Jared Himstead with Balcones. Uh, Balcones is a wonderful full lineup of whiskeys. Uh, I've been familiar with them for many years. Many people on here uh, have enjoyed uh, several of their expressions. They were introduced to me several years ago by Brett Pantani. Uh, Brett seems to introduce me to almost everything except for a few of the other people here, but he does a good job of that. So he told me about Balcone several years ago. Uh, Jared, welcome. Can you tell us where you're coming from tonight? Yeah, I'm in Waco. I'm at the distillery in my office. Um, like a lot of people last year, we all got used to having meetings wherever, but I've got a three-year-old and a 10-year-old and I and, uh, did one meeting at home and I was on the back porch and my then two-year-old just banged at the back window the entire time and my wife said, you're not doing those at home anymore. <laughs> so <laughs> if the kids are still awake, then I, I, I come back to, to the distillery. I'm not that far anyway, but. That's wonderful. And I also see that we have with us uh, somebody else from your team. Uh, I see uh, Alex Elrod. Can you tell us what Alex's role is with the company? Yeah, Alex does a whole bunch of stuff. He's a little bit of the, blending teams, connective tissue to the sales team. Um, he heads up our, our single barrel program. Um, he does a lot of education and training with sales folks we've got and even partners on the ground, distributor folks and stuff. Um, so yeah, he wears a lot. He actually doesn't wear a lot of different hats. He usually just wears that hat. Um, but figuratively, he wears a lot of different hats. Okay, very good. Very good. So uh, since we do have quite a few expressions here that you have very generously provided to us, and we really appreciate it. Uh, I'd like us to first go to the very first uh, expression we've posted uh, in the chat, uh, the lineup. And we're gonna be starting off with the Baby Blue, which you corrected me is not a bourbon, but is a corn whiskey. Can you please tell me what uh, technically the difference is uh, between the corn whiskey and a bourbon? Yeah, so bourbon has to be at least 51% corn. Um, corn whiskeys have to be at least 80 there is no top limit for either style. So you could do 100% corn whiskey and you could do a 100% bourbon. The bourbon obviously would have to be matured in virgin oak, which we also do. Um, but um, yeah, they are both What's 100. This is 100%. Um, and the used casks are all over the place. We have used Kentucky casks in house. Uh, you know, we, we make mostly, we make a ton of single malt. We also make our own bourbons and rice and stuff, rum. So we, we have a ton of used barrels around of our own that get in the mix as well. Okay, so this is not using virgin oak, so that's why you can't call it a bourbon. It's all used cask, yep. And um, are all these used casks from uh, expressions made within your distillery or from other places as well? Not completely. There's a, there's a decent amount of uh, um, mostly Four Roses and Buffalo Trace that get in the mix. We do have a lot of our own single malt and rye and bourbon barrels that we use as well. Now that we've been doing this long enough, um, they're getting finally kind of, you know, some of those barrels yeah. are getting decently used up enough to, uh, to not, to not over oak something and let, let the corn show through. Um, so yeah, this is, uh, one of the first things we ever made. We were working on our original distillery. We were building everything mostly ourselves and our mash ton was damaged. Uh, we started the whole company to do single malt. There really wasn't ever a conversation about doing anything other than single malt. Um, Killer. but we're sitting there with a, completely functional distillery except for one piece of equipment that you absolutely have to have to do malt um and i had had a product the last one. from uh hudson that they don't they haven't made in a long time they used to make a, a an unaged corn whiskey called grist mill and it was one of the, i think it was one of the first maybe craft approaches at doing corn that i had had and it was so it reminded me a lot of a tequila honestly um but it was so flavorful and so interesting and so all of a sudden we were just like well we could get going on something what if we messed around with corn and, you know, being malt guys primarily, one of the things that was in my thought process was it, you know, in, in bourbon land, corn's mostly there just to give you some alcohol and some sweetness. Uh -huh. What if we tried to get something nicer to use as the, as the base grain to begin with, get a nicer corn than usual, but also treat it a little differently. Um, you know, everything about our facility is built up for malt. So, you know, we're, we're, we're doing double pot distillation on four side stills and we're using M1 yeast and all these very traditional scotch approaches to malt. Um, so in some ways it was kind of a hypothesis to see if we, if we start with a, a really nice and flavorful corn to begin with and treated it a little bit more subtly between the oak 
and the fermentation and, and distillation process, could we get something that's a little, a little more elegant, a little more elevated than just sweetness, you know? Uh, can um, you, can you tell me, are you trying to make the blue corn or the baby blue the same for every year that you're making it? Is it always trying, are you trying to get consistency or is a little, is, or, you, or is it going to be different each time since um, you are using the different types of casks in the process? We go for, yeah, I think smaller producers have the liberty of, of, everyone's working within these parameters of what a product is, right? Um, I think really big brands, that, that window, that tolerance is extremely narrow. Um, and even people I know that I've, I don't know if any of y'all are familiar with Mike Nicholson was a distillery manager at Lagavulin for a lot of years. He's retired now and lives in Canada. Um, but I've hung out with him on multiple occasions since he's moved to uh, this side of the pond and even talking to him about his years there and the quality control and having your work your sensory work be tested then later by GCMS and having a computer tell your bosses if you made your bonus or not, that kind of stuff is kind of bonkers to me. Um, but I, I understand when you're, when you're traveling all over the world and a brand like Lagavulin, and you kind of want to grab that bottle and you expect it to be a certain thing. And if it wasn't, that's a problem. Right. Um, so in some ways I think there's a, there's a value that there's a, there's a benefit to being our, our size um, that we can kind of treat things a little bit more like vintages um, and we do know what baby blue is, but if if we have the barrels come out on the table in the blending room and I'm looking at them, and I wouldn't say like a peach or apricot note is a typical like descriptor for this whiskey, but if you had a season where the barrels got pulled, what's ready, and you're looking at it, you find a really nice pile of a few weeks or a few days that is that that, that is a little fruitier, or maybe it's a little spicier, maybe it's a little drier, maybe it's a little sweeter. I feel like it'd be kind of a shame to not run with that, you know. Right. Um, and, and emphasize what's working at any given season of, of blending. But do the bottles indicate the year of, for each one? Yeah, there's batch dates on the back. So it'll have the year okay. and then a sequential number after that that tells you which batch it was from that year. Right. Um, and it also has the bottling date. Yeah, Alex is showing us that right now. So, right. Because a lot right. of us, you know, we don't have the bottles with us, but we have are these little samples, you know, right. that, that, we, that we put together. Uh, well, I got to tell you, this thing's delicious. It's very sweet. I am getting the apricots from it. I'm getting maybe some white grapes. You know, right. it's, it's uh, very, very flavorful, um, very drinkable. So it's, it's almost too easy to drink. If you yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's the baby in there is definitely to imply youth. And we, you know, everybody's talked, plenty of people have talked to you. I've seen about Texas climate and what that looks like. Um, things that the wood extraction can happen really fast here. Um, I'm a huge space side guy. And so I can never get enough fruit and uh, especially a very lightly wooded whiskey. And so while it's definitely not that, um, a lot of our inspiration on how we approached trying to understand what the corn can do and then just kind of trying to enhance it and kind of bring it up into its best, best version of itself um, without being mellow corn and without being bourbon. Um, okay. Can you tell us a little bit about the corn before we move on to the single? Yeah. When we, very, when we first started, we actually were buying directly from the Hopi, um, off reservation, uh, reservation agriculture is very interesting. Um, most of what they're doing is for subsistence and then they sell the rest. So, um, the guy, the broker we were working with didn't really inform us of that. So we ran a bunch of whiskey and we were ready for, to receive another shipment of corn. And he was like, uh, that's kind of it for the year. Um, and then we found out there were some other farmers in the area, both on both sides of the border, even some, some folks in Texas that were growing um, with a very similar, if not the exact same strain. Um, and everybody seemed like was really struggling with it that wasn't actually like growing it um, on Hopi land. Um, so what we use, what we started using around that time is a hybridized version. So it is a hybridized uh, strain that was hybridized with the original kind of old school Hopi blue corn that's been around for thousands and thousands of years. Um, and it's more adapted to Texas climate. We've been growing it in Texas for, I think, the last six or eight years. Got it. Um, and we've got, they've got a lot of drought, but we also have, we get crazy rains. And I mean, it's, yeah, Texas weather is insane. So you got to have something that's pretty ridiculously hardy. Um, but yeah, this is blue corn. Um, I'm blanking on the name of the drink. There's a really classic drink. Uh, a lot of Mexicans still drink it, but it's like um, corn grits and like chocolate and maybe some chilies are added to it. And it's kind of like oatmeal porridge, but a little bit li more liquid mm. and they drink it. It's kind of like somewhere in between like a porridge and, and a hot chocolate. Yeah. Um, I'm blanking on what they call it, but they roast the blue corn as well for that. So that was another thing we tried early on. So we, it, is, um, it is roasted similar to how some barley varieties are roasted uh, before before milling and before fermentation. So there's there's some extra nuttiness. The oils are a little bit, um, you know, it's not fresh like like tasting olive oil. It's, it's got a cooked down oil kind of uh, vibe to it. 
Um, but yeah, this is well, the I'm first. Enjoying uh, it. We're getting some good comments. Yeah. People like this. So this is this great. Is the so. first whiskey, uh, the first legal whiskey ever made and sold in Texas. So this is Atole. Yes, thank you, Josh. Atole is what I was thinking. Oh, I love it. Um, I yeah, don't know if Josh, Josh, Josh knows a lot of things. Either that or he's good at Google. So I'm not so sure which one it is. But uh, we, we, we have to move on here because we, we are limited yep, by yep. time. Um, before we go into the next four, I just have a question for you about them. All four of the, of the expressions that are coming are single malt. Okay. Are they all the same grain? All four of these? No. No. Okay. All right. So then we are. Okay. So then the next one that we have for everybody is the lineage Texas single malt. So can you tell us a little bit about, about the grain in there and how this is aged? Yeah. The next three are going to go together kind of somewhat intentionally. Okay. Lineage, lineage is our newest uh, kind of core single malt. It is um, the next thing we're going to do, which is the Texas one single malt is the one we led with and what we made for, we've made been making for and selling for what, 12, 12 years now or whatever. Lineage is very new. Alex can answer better than me because I forget these things. Year, year and a half, we've been selling it. Um, but it Lineage is a mix of basically every avenue we've chased down with doing single malt in the US and Texas. So when we started, we were using Golden Promise, Simpsons Golden Promise, very classic strain, uh, very super popular 60s through the mid 80s uh, in Scotch production that's kind of fallen out of favor and um, been left behind by a lot of higher yielding um, newer strains like Concerto and Epic and stuff that people have switched to, not because they're more tasty, but because you literally just get more alcohol per pound, which also means that that has to mean that they're more starch, their starch levels are higher on these new strains. Um, and a lot of the other stuff that's also extremely flavorful, those levels have been intentionally bred down, um, just like a lot of feed corn and 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 Corn for fuel, the same idea. You don't need protein, you don't need oil, you just need carbs. Um, so Golden Promise, very traditional Scottish grain. It's really fun to work with something that used to be extremely popular um, and kind of defined mid 60s to mid 80s Scotch um, and to watch it kind of fall out of favor, but to be small enough where we can make those decisions based on taste and the savings to somebody like Diageo, if they can get you know a 10th of a percent more alcohol per pound is could be millions of dollars. And for us, it's not really that big a deal. So right. um, in some ways it's liberating to be a little bit smaller sometimes and get to make the right decisions. But so the Texas one, which is the thing we're gonna taste after this is 100% golden promise and aged very traditionally like American whiskey usually is, which is mostly virgin oak. Um, we have worked with the uh, ag school a little bit south of us for years on developing some barley that would be heat and drought resistant to grow in Texas. Uh -huh. um, so that is what the High Plains is, and this High Plains release is all in refill barrels. So if you combine both of those ideas, lineage is a mix of all of it. We've got Texas grown barley, we've got traditional Scottish barley, and we use both of those aged in both virgin and uh, refill. So we have basically four groups of stuff on the table. We have Golden Promise and virgin and refill, and then we have Texas barley and, gold and virgin oak and refill. And we mix those. I think the blend currently is sitting at a little bit about 60% of the blend is refill. It's about 60, 40, 65, 35, hovering in that range. And then that's for lineage? That, that's, that's for lineage, yeah. Okay, all right, lineage. So lineage okay. is a mix of, in our mind, both barley's from both both the place that inspires us and the place where we are, but also the, the maturation traditions of both places being refill and American being virgin. So Okay, so let me ask you just a few very specific questions about lineage. Uh, what kind of casks? All kinds. The, the virgin oak is going to be mostly American. There is some Hungarian oak in there, and there is some French in the virgin as well. The refill are a mix of RX bourbon and X rye that we make in-house, and some Buffalo Trace and Four Roses always make their way in there, too. Oh, nice. And how many years is this aged? This is a minimum of three. There's usually stuff older than that in there. Um, we didn't right, have any... You probably have issues uh, down there with how long you can go in terms of number of years because of the evaporation, right? We do. We we sold a single barrel last year, which is the oldest thing we've ever bottled. It was a six-year-old barrel of our blue corn bourbon. And we use extra large barrels too. Our barrels are 59 gallon, not 53. So wow. theoretically, when you're filling it, you're filling it with about 300 bottles worth of, of liquid. Right. Um, and at six years with no adulteration, we didn't move it. We didn't dilute it. We didn't do anything to it along the way. There were 71 bottles left. Oh my so, God. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's something. So from, some... I want to make sure everybody heard that. Okay. They went from 300 bottles down to 71. Okay. So, so you're, you're at a quarter, you're less than a quarter. Yeah. That's in six wow. years. So, and that's a virgin oak. Cause I was bourbon refill casks tend to tend to have their pores a little bit clogged up from whatever was in them first and they don't lose as much the first year. Uh -huh. um, so refill barrels can do a little bit better. 
Um, that's also not a very, you know, that's not a statistically significant sample size or anything, but that's right, the oldest thing we've done. We do have a barrel of rum up upstairs that's nine years old and it is uh, over half full. So that, that's encouraging, right. but that was in a used cast. Got it. Um, so yeah, so the pores were full of it. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. then uh, I, I have to tell you just some of the quick comments. People are loving the lineage. They say some sweetness, you know, it's reminding them of like, a, you know, oatmeal, breakfast, brown sugar, walnuts. Uh, people are really enjoying this. Um, so tell us about, we're going to move on to your classic. Okay. This is one of your flagship expressions. Okay. Mm -hmm. The uh, Texas single malt. So uh, what is it about it that makes it a flagship expression? And if I remember correctly, you said that this is 100% uh, golden. Is that right? It's 100% Simpsons golden promise. Yep. Unpeated. And uh, it's not 100% virgin oak, but the large majority of it is. And the profile is definitely intended to kind of emphasize an oak maturation that's very familiar for someone who's a Ryan bourbon drinker. Uh, from American whiskey, um, but everything up to the bar up to, up to the barrel, uh, aging and maturation part is couldn't couldn't be more traditional, um, Scotch approached. Well, because you said um, you're a Scotch guy, you like space. Yeah, right? of course. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah so this was the first single malt we ever did. 2011, we started selling this late. I think November, maybe 2011. Um, if any of y'all are familiar with Neil Ridley and Joel Harrison, they used to they've they've written some books and they they. I've been focusing a lot more on gin and cocktails and bars the last few years, but they used to run a show called Best in Glass. Um, um, <laughs> Williams shouting out Lockside. He knows that's that's one of my soft spots. Um, <laughs> I traded I traded with him for some Lockside at one point a few months back. I think. Um, oh, that's funny. <laughs> and if anybody has has not had any Lockside, you should do yourself a favor and find yourself some Lockside, which is not easy or cheap, but. Okay, well, we'll just go down uh, yeah. to St. Louis and we'll raid Myers. Yeah, he's got, he's got, he's got less than he used to because he gave me some. But okay. <laughs> make him open it. If it's closed, he should open it. Um, man, I don't know what I was talking about before. Okay, well, we're talking about the there. lineage. Yeah. We're talking about the lineage. You know about Scotch, and uh, th this, this is it. Does remind me of Space Side. You know, it's a little bit spicy on the end. You know, uh, tell me about the casks that, again that we use for this. Oh. So yeah, the one is the the classic is going to be. Uh, usually about 60 to 70 percent American virgin. Uh -huh. um, then there's usually somewhere between about 20 to 30 of the Hungarian, the European oak that I was talking about. Uh -huh. And then there's always maybe, I don't know, sometimes between maybe like 5 percent up to 10 percent, depending on the batch of uh, virgin French as well. We have moved on to the classic. He was talking about lineage of this kind of this whiskey, I think. Um, I was going to say something about, else about Golden Promise, but it, it has escaped me. We, oh, the, yeah, the, the best in glass thing. Sorry. Hey, poor Alex. He gives these spiels all the time because he's a sales guy. This is what he does. This is bread and butter. And he's sitting here going, man, this guy does not know how to talk about our products. <laughs> um, forgetting all the things you're supposed to say. Uh, but the best in glass was fun. And Neil and Joel have become friends over the years. But they, they were, they were kind of notoriously a little bit... Uh, not gung ho about American craft, at, you know, in the, in the early 2000s, early late 2000s, early 2010s. Um, but anyway, they had this best in glass competition where they would they would do blind tasting on new releases of malt. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if they put it in on purpose or if somebody squirreled it in, but our our Texas One Classic Single Malt made it into that blind that year. And when they pulled the plastic bag off. Or the paper bag off they realize that we'd won and they jokingly even in the reveal on the awards we're kind of having to take back some of their words about small barrels and americans don't know what they're doing but <laughs> yeah um, we've heard that from some people about uh you know that small barrels tend to be a little bit more woodsy that they can taste them and then sometimes you end up not being able to taste the difference you know it, 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 it's funny how that works it's a lot it, about how you treat it right you know right you gotta gotta understand the, the tools you're working with so the malting, um, do you guys do the malting yourself or, or, or are you getting are you, are you getting malt from elsewhere? So Simpsons uh, owns this strain. This is a proprietary strain of theirs, Golden Promise. And only two people in the world malt it. They malt it themselves. And then they also uh, let Thomas Fawcett, which is another malting house uh, based in the UK, Thomas Fawcett can also malt and sell Golden Promise from the Simpsons family. Oh. Um, yeah, there's always oh, someone okay. mentioned Red Hot. So there's always a lot of cinnamon on here. Yeah, I was just thinking that. It reminds me of Red Hots. And 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 I want to make sure everybody realizes this is a higher proof than what we tasted before. This yeah. is now so the, the Texas Single Malt Classic, this is 53, okay, 53%, okay, ABV 106. Uh, so it is a little hotter, but it doesn't 
it doesn't need the water in my mind. You know, I, I, I love this. I think it was delicious. Thanks. Yeah. It's, it's a little bit of, it's a little bit of a weird combo for people to get their head around. And, and, and sometimes until we explain, if you've had a bunch of older scotch, like eventually things can get woody, right? So anyone who's had like right. 25 year old stuff, that's a little more familiar. You finally have gotten a lot of, a lot more wood extractives. Um, but it really is kind of trying to have a, a foot in both traditions. And um, it's surprising how many times we're at a show, you know, we'd be whiskey live in New York or something, whiskey fest. And, um, people that come to the table and say they're bourbon guys and not malt drinkers and like they may walk away and this might be their favorite thing because really a, a lot of what they what they enjoy about bourbon and rye is, is virgin oak and um, there's a lot of that there you know i gotta um, say something funny is that um it, yeah everybody comes at this differently i mean the blom brothers you know when we when we invited when we uh uh, interviewed the Blom brothers almost a year ago. Uh, they said that they came into this because they love scotch and they wanted to make something like that here in the United States, you know, and then, you know, you're, you're a space side guy, but the, a few weeks ago, you know, we had uh, Dr. Pat, Patrick Heist uh, on. And what most people here don't know, this is really funny. So after our talk with Dr. Pat, he was emailing with Eric and me, you know, about a few mm -hmm. questions, you know, and follow up and stuff. And Dr. Pat actually said something. He said that he wished that he had asked all of us what our favorite scotches are because he doesn't know much about scotch. And I said, thank God you didn't ask that question. <laughs> okay, <laughs> because we would have gone down a rabbit hole with this group with, the, with what they have on the shelves. Because if somebody, you know, but it's really funny how it's like, he said that he's a bourbon guy, period. You know, that that's what he knows. And they've, they've branched out to rye, but he was brought up on Kentucky bourbon, you know? And you yeah. have... But like Scott, so how, how did you come into this? Because if I remember correctly, reading your bio online, you were a bartender. You, you know, you were in uh, beer first, right? It was beer. Yeah, I actually never ended up getting into beer professionally. But uh, yeah, I, I I was I got a home brewing setup. A friend of mine in college gave me a home brewing setup for graduation, and uh, I got into that pretty avidly and was was pretty active with that. And um, thank goodness it didn't work. But we tried to open breweries multiple times um, in the late late nineties, early two thousands here in Waco. It didn't really work out. Um, left my nonprofit job I was at to help a friend who was going to open a bar. And the idea was I'm going to, we were just going to have brew, you know, brew pub style. It's like beer for there, not distribution or anything, but like, we're going to brew on site. We're also going to have just a great selection of global, um, really cool beer. Um, and that just kind of dragged on and the space was a little bit too small. And at some point we realized that just probably was never going to happen. But in those years, uh, yeah, I, I had just kind of fallen in love with, with, with Scottish single malt and, um, once again, this is the early 2000s. There's not a whole lot on the shelf in Texas. There's, you know, it didn't take long to go through everything that was available. Um, <laughs> and um, we didn't have that problem here in Chicago. <laughs> no, no. Bigger markets. I don't even think, I mean, I'm in Waco. It's not a very big place, but I don't even think Dallas and Austin back then. It wasn't what it is now by a long shot. Um, but yeah, I just was pretty taken by it. And um, when another one of my brewing buddies and a uh, friend of the family who's got a little money, and it, it kind of seemed at every stage, we were just talking about stuff. We may or may not have made some stuff in the, in the garage um, just to try our hand at it. And next thing I know, we're looking at buildings and then we've signed a lease. And at some point, a few months later, we're building equipment. We're knocking out walls. We're building platforms. We're shaping copper to try to get our condensers made and stuff. And it was like, at some point, it all hit us that we probably all needed to quit our jobs, that this wasn't really good. There wasn't enough time in the day <laughs> to, to do everything. So um, I'm, I'm missing whatever the gene is that makes people risk averse. So I don't remember ever thinking, is this going to work or is this going to take, or is this a bad idea? Um, I, Alex is a little bit the same way. Alex has a lot of really cool woodwork and leather work. And we've got guys in house that are, you know, rabid uh, bread bakers or guys that love to smoke meat, you, you know, mm -hmm. whatever, pretty diverse group of people that I would all say are pretty DIY and hands-on and the idea you, you've got some kindred spirits in here when you were yeah. saying a lot of those things a lot of people were nodding their heads <laughs> well, i think just the, the the idea that if you love something that you're experienced with it is just drastically enhanced if you get you try That's your right. hand at, at it yourself and so that's Absolutely. kind of where it started um of course we had no idea that what was about to happen both in american whiskey and more specifically with craft um you know in 2008 when we got started it was a little bit of lightning in a bottle the right place right time we were just doing what made sense to us which is we wanted we loved whiskey we're kind of makers ourselves. Let's let's see what we can do. Um, well, well yeah. one of the reasons why I, I knew about you, I've known about you guys for almost a decade now, is because a few of us on here, uh, we support a homeless shelter here in Chicago. And one mm -hmm. of the ways we support it is that they have an annual fundraiser and we run the craft whiskey table at that fundraiser every year. And That's it's awesome. the most popular table. People come to us all the time. Uh, and every year before that, I have a meeting with Brett Pantani at Finney's where he helps me select what we're going to have at the table. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. So that's how I've actually gotten to know before these interviews, a lot of the different expressions because cool. Brett has introduced me to these over the years. And so we actually had uh, this, te- you know, we had your Texas single malt, you know, several years ago yeah. uh, at that's the cool. table. So yeah, no, it's, it's great. That's, stuff. And then, yeah. That's, that's what, what I was doing right after, when I, before opening the bar with my friend. Yeah. The, the nonprofit I work for still runs the only, the only shelter we've got here in town. Um, as Mission Waco is the name of the organization that I worked there for about eight years after college, but it's it's literally like three blocks from the from the distillery, so that there's a lot of that in my DNA too, from my my past. So all right, well let, let's talk about yep. High Plains because so, I've got to tell you, you are, you are teasing me with the name of one of my favorite movies. Okay, okay. So <laughs> uh, let, let's talk about High Plains. Yeah, so High Plains is the uh, the Texas side of what goes into lineage. Um, this is the this is a, a mix of a couple of different varieties of barley. Um, we're still in the in the in the weeds on that, just like you know you hear you hear a lot about what work Westland's doing and and Waterford and people like that. But um, I think we've laid down uh, five to seven different uh, barley varieties so far in Texas, and kind of doing a lot of trials with each. So these first year batches were really not even intended to go out. We weren't growing it and 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 turning it into whiskey to release this. But I was working on a lineage blend and I found these barrels. There's, I think there's only three or four barrels that went into this blend. And I just really liked them and I couldn't bring myself to put them into a big blend with a bunch of other stuff. So these are all refill. Um, mm-hmm. These are all our own barrels. So these are going to be a mix of, I think one of them is a single malt barrel. One's a rye. And I think the other one might have even been a blue corn barrel. I don't remember. Um, but these are our barrels, not Kentucky uh, used barrels. Okay. And this is uh, from the very first year of the Texas barley that we got um the age statement says 27 i think that's about right i think gabe was saying they're, they're all between like two and four two and three years something like that but um you know it's funny you mentioned that you found some casts some barrels that you didn't want to blend with the other things uh you know years ago mccallan had a few of what they called uh their a grand reserve edition so they had like the eight mccallan 18 but they also had mccallan grand reserve and mccallan grand reserve were some casks that they found that they just couldn't bring themselves to blend with the rest <laughs> because they felt they were so darn good. You can't um, do that all the time. You know, now, you do have to, you do have your, your expressions and you have to like, you've come, you've got orders in and you've got distributors and, and stores like Benny's that have asked for a certain amount and you do need to get it out to them. But every once in a while, you, you gotta, um, you gotta set some things aside for yourself. I can't believe that this is a 57 ABV. Yeah. You know, it, it does not drink like a 57 ABV. Uh, this is, I, I, I would almost like question that because it's drinking so smoothly. I hate to put words in other people's mouths, but we hear people say it a lot. And we, I know we all internally feel this way. I think most of our stuff drinks lower than it. Like it, I think in generally, it usually reads lower than it actually is. And I don't know if that's oil content from the way we're running the stills, um, higher oil and protein content and the kind of grains we're using that is good. There's, there's more going on than just, than just booze, but um can you talk a little bit about that oil content? Because you have a really good mouthfeel on these. Yeah, mouthfeel is really important to us. Even something that I would consider, even some of our expressions that I consider drier, which of course, in general, when that, you know, we're mostly kind of borrowing wine terms at this point and, and beer terms, I guess, a little bit as well. But when you actually have residual sugar, which you don't have that much in whiskey, most of the sugar is going to get left behind. Hopefully it's been turned into alcohol anyway. Um, but you can get, uh, especially with a pot still, depending on how hard you run and what, how you're doing, how you're running con- your condensers and stuff, um, there are a lot of, uh, oils that can come over and then there's acids that behave as lipids that are really chemically acids, but have the physical properties of fats and oils. Um, and pot stills, you just get that. You don't really get that. You, you can, it's really, would be really difficult to get that on a pot. I mean, on a, on a column. Um, but we spend a lot of time on mouthfeel and it's a, it's pretty important to us. And I, I, I do like to always point out that that's a little bit different than, than, than residual sugar or a it can be round because it's sweet and cloying, um, or it can just be coating and, and slick and, and kind of full without the sweetness, which would be um, usually more like lipid and fatty acid content. But. Well, people are loving this, you know, that they really are loving this. And again, you know, a lot of the comments have to do with the fact that uh, it does not drink like, like a 57 ABV, you know, it's, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, I, I'm, 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 I'm pretty enamored with this release. We've, di- we've released it twice. The first release was Virgin Oak, mostly because we wanted to showcase the difference between the Golden Promise and Virgin, which were very people are very familiar with from us. Um, this was just kind of literally, I was just sitting there and I couldn't, I couldn't keep okay. myself from, from bottling. By it. the way, you're getting some praise here. So, so one, one of our regulars, Naomi Weiss, she is 
very particular. I don't know how she was able to settle upon a husband because she said on particular, but she loves very specific whiskeys. And I love her comments here. She actually said that you're the Buna Haben of Texas. Oh, well, that's high praise. Thank you. Okay, so that 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 <laughs> is, you know, that that's wonderful. And and by the way, Eric uh, is able to copy the whole chat and send it to you. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll make sure that you and Alex get a copy of the whole chat when we're done. Okay. So let, let's go on to the peated version. So, all right, an American peated single malt. Okay, tell us about the grain and please tell us about the peating process yeah. here. So this is another one that's kind of, cool to me back when i was uh get, super getting into home brewing uh if you looked in the brewing catalogs and you were ordering supplies i never did beer with peated malt i don't, i'm not a big fan of smoking beer personally but the peated malt that was always in the catalogs was peated golden promise of course that's what we make our single malt with uh and so we finally came around to moving into our new building and we were getting close and I reached out to the Simpsons family and I said, Hey, I don't see Peter Golden Promise. What are you guys repeating these days? And they're like, oh, we're using Epic, I think at the time. And I was like, well, I want that to be the only variable. We already make a bunch of single malt with Golden Promise. I would really love to have the only variable be now to get to play with Pete on the, with everything else staying the same. And they said, oh, we don't do that anymore. You'd have to buy a whole malting floor worth. And we were like, well, how much is that? And it's like, well, it's, it's, it's a whole truck. Like it's a container, it's a shipping container. That comes on the back of the truck. You got to be able to take that much. And I was like, well, how many pounds is that? And I think it's something like 27,000 pounds. I don't remember what it was. But we, at our new facility, our old place was super tiny. Um, when we moved into our new distillery, it's like, oh yeah, we can do that. So a truckload makes about three fermentations. Each one of our fermenters will give us about 16 to 18 barrels. So we're laying down less than 60 a year um, when we get a bit one truckload from them. And the other th cool thing was I was trying to figure out from them, when was the last time you did this? Like, oh, we haven't been doing this for like a decade. So to best of our knowledge, this is, we're the only people making Peter Golden Promise into whiskey on the planet currently. Ah, um, interesting. Okay. The other thing that was really cool is we got, we can custom our peat levels. So the first round we got was 35 ppm. The second round was 65. The last round we got was 99. What kind of peat? Okay, so, so this is Highland. Kind of this is Highland. This is Peat. Highland Pete. It yeah, is Highland. Is Highland Peat. Peat. Okay. So it's all, all done. Right. Simpsons is kind of pretty, pretty north and east, almost to the coast, uh, Highland. And so it's Pete from that area, um, which is also, man, if, if anybody hasn't ventured out and had the just the proliferation of peated stuff that's not Isla from the last few years, or just not Island, it's fantastic. But I yes. think Ben Re Riet, the Curiositas tenure, is mm -hmm. a great example for anyone who has never started to pick up the nuances of. Not just regions of Scotland, but the peat regions of Scotland. It's a great right. Highland, Highland. It's a great Highland peat yeah. example. To kind I of love uh, Lechig. You know, Lechig. Mm -hmm. You know, yep. is, is is a wonderful like, example. You know, there, there are a lot of them out there. So, and but but this is also not just peated. It's also the Sauternes cask, right? We do a lot of weird uh, moving of barrels around. <laughs> There's some of our friends in the U.S. A lot of people have kind of adopted uh, elevage and these other kind of uh, you know cognac and brandy techniques of like slow slow dilution and things like that. We don't we don't do anything that systematic but a lot of times if we have a virgin oak that's getting too uh too tannic or too spicy we will dilute it in barrel or we'll transfer it to a more used cask for the rest of its life cut the proof a little bit um so this barrel's had a really interesting life so this is the peter golden promise this is from our second order so this is 65 ppm highland peat um it was in used buffalo trace for its first almost three years about two and a half years in a, a used buffalo trace barrel it was pretty spent we had ordered some Sauterne. I'm just, I love dessert wine. I got into dessert wine through whiskey like I think a lot of people do when you just want to understand more about what these, these, these styles of wine are doing to your casks. And I actually wasn't Sauterne first. There's other botrytized wine. If we want to get into botrytization and noble rot and maybe somebody else on the call is more of a wine expert than me, there's a whole family of wines that that is happening to that are processed a certain way. Uh, Lupiac was actually what I found first, but to come to find out there's this whole family, Salsignac and all these other um wines well, we have, have we have some wine people on here yeah. and, and i'm afraid we could really get into the weeds on that if yeah. we ask them to talk about it <laughs> yeah that might be uh, after we're done recording maybe um yeah, seriously. anyway I, I loved i i i was a big port fan uh obviously anybody who's, who's into single you've got to you've got to spend your time with with sherry styles um i grew up in brazil and uh, so madeira is, is is not from brazil but they're portuguese speakers so i, I got a, i got a soft spot for that um but 
man, these botrytis dessert wines are just killer to me. And so we were pretty careful about the kind of cast that we felt like we're already exhibiting some white wine character, some grape skin character, um, or some nice kind of, you know, there's kind of, there can be hints of cheese, um, you know, like lighter, fresh, like Mexican there's some fresh funk. cheese. Yeah, I'm definitely yeah, getting some yeah. funk from it, but, but mm -hmm. it, it, it's blending with the scotch and, and I have with the, with the peat. Um, I, I do have to tell you that we're getting some amazing comments here. And one of the reasons why Eric and I love doing this is because we love introducing new lineups to people who haven't had them before. Okay. And, you know, many of the people here are really enjoying these expressions. Can you tell us um, where you are available in the United States? Obviously, those of us here in Chicago, we have access to most of your expressions because most of them show up here. But are you all over the country right now? Yeah, I think we're in all of the 48. Alex can nod or not. Um, I don't really do that much on that side of the business, but okay. I think uh, we partner with Davos Brands, who a lot of y'all might know from Aviation Gin is like their big kind of standard bearer, That's mm -hmm. but but uh, they, they've helped us with distribution outside of Texas and Oklahoma. Um, we're also partnered with Southern Glaciers nationally, okay. so they've done a lot to help. help. We've really just the last year, okay. we went from like, you know, 20 something states to, to lower 48 so and and the special edition so obviously you know like like the baby blue and the texas single malt you know and your rise those are going to be available everywhere okay mm -hmm. but what about you know like the special editions like this peated and the high plains you know are, are those available everywhere or only in texas now high plains has only been bottled twice like i said there was mm -hmm. there were only three barrels there was like 600 bottles that came out of that wow. batch and okay. it was a distillery only a little bit mm -hmm. of a vanity project for me. I just wanted to drink it. So um, the Peter <laughs> Sotarian, the Peter Sotarian we sent you was a single barrel. Mm -hmm. um, we actually didn't run the ABV on this, so I don't know what this is. I'm guessing it's it's got to be like 63 or something because we I don't think we've cut it or diluted it or anything. Uh, so actually, it says here that it? this particular cask was 52 and a half percent. Yeah. No, 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 no. That's that's months. You look at the 52.5 on the label. Is that's the that's the computer pops out like an age thing. So that's 52.5 oh. months. That's not the proof. This is, this oh, is, guys, this is All right, everybody, I want to make sure you realize that, that on the label that we printed for you, because we, we print up, just so you can see here, Jared, we yeah. print up little labels on these little bottles. And so you're telling us that there's a mistake with this label. That 52.5 is months. It's not ABV. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Something yeah. up there. Okay. All right. That's our bad. So what do you think the ABV on this is actually 63? I mean, yeah, it would have gone in at 62 something and would have climbed from there. We transferred it a few times. All right, what are you showing um, us, Bloom? Right, Bloom is trying to show us something. Bloom, unmute quickly, please. I have the I have the bottle that you sent because yep. we do that after we pour. And fifty two five is the only thing that looks like an ABV on the bottle, so I guess we don't yep. have anything recorded as. Yeah, that one was hand. I want to make sure everybody realizes. Jared sent us something. Jared and Alex sent us something special. It was a handwritten label. Okay, so we're all drinking something here that had a handwritten label. Yeah, okay. this is a this is a single barrel. I mean, this isn't okay. out yet. All right. This Thanks, Bloom. Thanks, Bloom. Appreciate it. We're 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 going to work on the blend soon, and hopefully, okay. I'll get I'll get labels and everything wrapped up, and this will go out to market at the end of the year. It's, it's scheduled okay. for December release, but I've been working on this for years. So obviously, this is fifty months. It's great. People 48. are loving it. Um, look, uh, out of every out of respect for your time and everybody yep. else's time, I don't want to dominate all the questions here. Uh, Eric, do you have any specific questions for Jared at this time? Uh, well, so first of all, thank you very much uh, for joining us, and actually, uh, thank you very much for the uh, the very generous number of samples. Um, it was funny because the first batch came, and so it was the six bottles, three expressions, and I grabbed it. And I was like, "Yes, we got it!" And then a couple days later, another package showed up, and I was like, "Wait a minute." Wait, what, what? Wait, who is this from? And I opened it up, and it was a second batch from you guys. So, uh, yes, I very much appreciate it. And I definitely uh, geeked out when I pulled out the bottle, and it was the handwritten label. Uh, that always makes me happy. Um, Those are the kind of things that I don't know that are the smartest when you if you involve the marketing team and things like this, you know. Um, but I have a hard time not sending out the things that we we know we have that we're excited about and we're looking at. Like I'm like I've got to get this stuff out to people. That's the stuff I want to talk about, you know, the stuff that's coming and what we're working on currently. So especially when you have a group that you're pretty sure like I got a I got a pretty decent guess on the kind of stuff that, might, that these these people might get excited about. And it's fun to have someone on the other side of the screen that like I know right, you know, like this is the stuff that we're pumped about. So um, yeah. Things don't always uh, go that way. We also like, I think this is one of the shorter things that we've done. And I mean, a lot of people do two, three 
if anybody's ever been involved in any of the Dramer stuff, they'll try to keep you till like one in the morning. So um, I think, I don't think we knew that there was a, a the close trying to shoot for wedging in in an hour when we sent five samples, we might've done it a little bit differently, but I'm also happy we did. So. So are we, so are we happy? <laughs> Definitely. Uh, Eric, any other questions? Uh, nope. All right, uh, let's... we can probably open up. Uh, Josh okay. Eisenberg, you're first. All right, cool. Thanks. This is this has been incredible. I'm just blown away. I I was really curious if you could tell us the story about like what inspired uh, Rumble. Um, that just is another totally unique. It's just unique, and I'm just you know would love the background on like what how did you even come up with that. Um, that is one of the things I had the least to do with, um, without getting into, you know, some of the hairier parts of our company history. One my, my first partner, one of our, one of our, one of the first three original three partners who's not with the company anymore, um, had, we were having a dinner party and he made, he was, we were making uh, bananas foster for dessert. And it was one of those kind of, you're in the kitchen grabbing random things that sound like they should go go good and i know some of y'all cook like that my wife's kind of a recipe person and i kind of go oh there's some fresh sage like we should what if what, what about this so all of a sudden before long the bananas foster in the in the saucepan little flames going ended up with some honey and some figs in it and we're sitting there eating it and it was just kind of like man we should make we should distill this this is delicious and we did and that's rumble <laughs> it's really uh, a silly funny story just kind of quirky sidebar but it, it also happened while we were working on the mashed that was broken so we get the corn whiskey laid down and it was like well shit let's order some figs and honey and you know try that dessert sauce turned into turned into what it's not rum it's mostly uh it's mostly demerara but it's dry demerara which almost nobody uses for rum most everybody's using molasses um but then we got sugar and did some honey and a little bit of fig in there and it's not brandy it's not rum what is it who knows but i've been wanting to kind of push the boundaries a little bit Obviously, with American regulations, you can't do a co-ferment of grain and fruit and call it whiskey. It's got to be all all grain. But I think it's an overdue idea. And anybody who's done beer, if you if you're if you're doing adjuncts, whether it's you know a stout that's got some coffee and vanilla in it, or you're going to fruit fruit like a mixed culture beer or something, having those things get to mingle and kind of congeal and coalesce together during fermentation during aging is super important. Not to just add it later. Um, so obviously the easy route is to get like brandy barrels or, or some sort of fruit liquor, liqueur barrels or something to get some fruit back in on the back, back end of a single malt. But I, I think, I think I'm gonna have to pull the trigger and, and get some peaches or some cherries or something in there with some grain and just ferment it all together and see where that goes. Partly inspired by what happened with, with the figs and honey and sugar. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Well, feel free to send us samples of those. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we'll get them in the right hands. I think uh, Terry Dinterman is next. Terry, please unmute. Yes. Hey, uh, so first of all, I just lo love everything I've had tonight. Um, hey, I, I lived in uh, Houston for a couple of years back in the 1980s. And uh, yeah, I don't know if you could find a single malt back then. So just wondering what's been the reception as you've introduced this into the Texas market? How's it been received? It's gone pretty good. I mean, um, Texas, like I said, Texas didn't have any whiskey until we put some on the market. Uh, and then Garrison was... Uh, very close falling right behind us um, which is pretty crazy if you think about Texas and what I think that people imagine you've got these you've got you know you watch the Lonesome Dove or something and you've got these cattle cattle drives and dudes drinking whiskey turns out it wasn't made here you know uh, they were either getting it in, in, in Kentucky or Tennessee or maybe they were getting it in Colorado I don't know but they weren't getting it here um, so in some ways it's been liberating there's no tradition you know um, it's a blank slate and I think some of us that got in early um, have helped set the tone and kind of and steered that a little bit. And surprisingly, we have a, a we're pretty overrepresented for, Ameri for American single malt producers in Texas. I think partly because we led with that um, and we kind of jumped into that early um, that a lot of our, of our friends that are smaller and newer have, have taken that route and just run with, run with single malt, um, which is really exciting. It's pretty cool. Um, I know you guys had Chris on, right? Did you guys have Chris Reisbeck on not too long ago? Um, so I won't, I won't reiterate. We, yeah, we had Chris. We had Chris. Yeah, definitely. every 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 American single malt person you've got is gonna. We could go through the normal like, how's the category going and where we're at, but you guys. Right. Well, we actually that's recently. a good question. I'm I'm glad that uh, Terry asked that because um, you know Paul Letko, 
You know, he he you know he has very strong opinions about it, and you know what the category means, and if it really does mean anything yet, uh, because it seems like it means whatever it is to a particular distillery at that time, because. You know, well, what are the actual standards uh, at this point? But uh, those of us who drink know what single malt means. You know, we, we, we know that we're talking here about, you know, the, 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 the you know, barley is, is the primary grain from one distillery. So right. we'll have you it's, take it from there. In some ways, it's not that complicated, right? I right. Mean, right. It's pretty simple. The, the malt is malted barley and the single is one distillery. Um, right. It's got to be 100% malted, which can create a problem for some American producers because people like Westland that have played around with roasted uh, malts and specialty malts that have been kiln and caramelized and stuff. Some of those aren't malted. Um, we actually did, we're doing something the other day. We did a collaboration. There's a, there's a really pretty well-known brewery south of here called Jester King that does a lot of mixed culture beer. Um, and we turned one of their stout recipes into a malt. And even one of my other blenders just realized the other day, it can't be American single malt because it, some of those specialty roast grains that you're going to use in a, in a stout are not actually malted. Um, uh, they're, roast, they're roasted unmalted. So Got it. getting in the weeds a little bit but the biggest thing to me is what do what does that mean globally and we know there's some things that are specific to scotland everyone knows that so that's off the table that's their those are their issues right india doesn't care what scotland's doing japan seems to care kind of seems to want to do whatever scotland's doing somewhat um australia like everybody else doesn't really oh they're limited by these things that's we're not going to limit ourselves that way we've kind of learned the hard way from what the swa and everyone's gone through that there's some limitations that can be a little bit tough for people but Everybody agrees that it's 100% malted barley. Everybody agrees it's got to be from one distillery, right? Not everybody agrees it should be pot or column. Not everybody agrees if it should be virgin or used oak. Like, cool. Like, let's leave all that out. So in some ways, our definition is part of what's important about our, our definition that we propose is what we've left out, um, which is not trying to tell American distillers how they have to mature it or what kind of equipment they can use to make it. At the same time, knowing everybody in the world thinks this is made of one distillery and it's made from 100% malted barley. So those are non-negotiable, right? I'm um, glad Terry asked that question. It's a good yeah. question. It's, it's a longer discussion. Um, Bloom, please unmute. Great. So um, also loving everything we tasted tonight. I'm going to ask uh, Alex a question because otherwise he gets to be like Silent Bob this evening. Um, and it's nice to have you on board. So one of the many uh, things that you uh, were introduced as doing at Balcones is blending. And that's something that's near and dear to my heart. And it's also something different than single malts. So I'm wondering, aside from being somebody who helps create the flagship uh uh, things that we had tonight, where do you get to play when it comes to blending at Balcones? That's a, it's an interesting question because I, I do, I mostly bother Jared and Gabe and Johnson and uh, Andrew's part of the team now, um, mostly with kind of consumer feedback because these, these guys obviously have very, very refined palettes, uh, very refined understandings of the industry. Um, and so my contribution is less about physically blending and more about kind of just more philosophical understanding of what's going on. Um, I'm not very philosophical, but it's more kind of just poking the bear, prodding, pushing things along. Uh, I mean, I, I do kind of experiment um, being heavily involved in the single barrel program with flavor maturation by way of cask finishing or looking at new versus used, but I, I'm at the mercy of Jared and Gabe uh, and what the warehouse is, is telling us uh, and what's available and, and what's coming down the pipeline. And so I'm kind of a squeaky wheel when it comes to a lot of those things. Uh, so it, it's minimal in the sense of physically blending and marrying casks. That's Jared and Gabe through and through hundred percent. I'm kind of just peering over them and bought. Like, yeah. And, and I would also say we kind of, um, it's not like on the org chart anywhere what the creative team is, but we kind of know who the stakeholders are and who who kind of you know bleed uh, balconies and everyone's got a specific role within that kind of group of people. Um, so a lot of Alex's curating of the single barrels for the single barrel program. So it, sometimes it goes backwards. Sometimes I've got a big pile and he tells me he needs a certain amount of a certain uh, spirit type. And I've got a pile for him to look at when he comes back. And then he kind of calls that down into what he wants. Um, and sometimes it's the other way around. Sometimes he might make a pile and I'll go through. And he's like, yeah, I just need 12 out of these 30 or whatever. I need to make it. And like, I'll pick the ones I like best or whatever. But there's a lot of back and forth. He helps me a lot with label design, which I still do. I need to pass that off to somebody eventually. But um, yeah, there's, there's a, there's, the creative little brain trust is, is definitely 
there, even for people that aren't doing the hands-on blending that much. His job is actually in the inverse. He's he's trying to find single barrels, so he's doing the opposite. He's trying to think, find things that pull apart and, and stand alone. And also, he, you know, he has to know his know know the, know the counts and know people at Benny's and know people at Poison Girl and know people wherever and know what they want to look at. You know, there's not that many samples you can look at in a setting, and we've got to pick from hundreds that we're going to show people. And if we know what you're looking for, so those relationships are, are important. And he also looks great. I mean, look. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for the insight into the process. He's our, our eye candy in the blending room, you know? That's great. Wonderful. Uh, Beth, I see you have a question. If you could uh, unmute, please. Well, first, thank you for pushing five tastings in 40 minutes. <laughs> so whenever I don't drink my husband's deals, then that's not happening because this whiskey is amazing. Thank it's you. really good. So I am specifically a Scotch whiskey gal myself, um, but this group is slowly turning me. I was curious. Um, you said you ha you got your peat from the Highlands. Do you know what area? Uh, I'd have to look at a map. I want to say, oh man, I'm blanking right now on where uh, the Simpsons facility is. Man, I know where Forsyth is, and I. I think I'm mixing the two up. I don't know exactly where the facility is. I could find out though. Yeah, no, I'm just curious. My family's from the, the Highlands. Oh, cool. Um, um, actually, it looks like uh, William uh, Myers, Bill Myers, our source of lots of information, has said that it's uh, the same source as Ardmore. Interesting. Cool. Yeah. I didn't even know that. Well, there you go. <laughs> Thanks, William. You're all learning something. <laughs> no, everything's amazing. I am definitely, I mean, I'm drinking all the peat one for sure. Like, that's really good. Have you had, uh, I think I said, it's, it tasted to me like, um, I know you said it wasn't the Isle of Pete, but it tasted like Smokehead or Pete Monster to me. I don't mm -hmm. know if anyone agreed or if anyone's had that. A little. Well, the Smokehead I got in Scotland tastes different from the one here, which is disappointing because the one in Scotland is absolutely fantastic. And the second we got it here at Benny's, I grabbed one and it's just... Wasn't the same. Um, no. There was some really cool um, Kilcoman during their first few years when they were releasing pretty young stuff. Uh, I've, I can see the bottles up on my shelf now. I, I can't read from here what they are, but I know there was they were doing a bunch of really cool barrel finishes yeah. and putting those out. Um, this is probably like four or five years ago now. Um, and there's something to me. I don't know why with 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 the citrus and some of the stone fruit stuff you can get, and obviously the 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 kind of white grape and grape skin things you can get and the funk and cheese. I don't know why more people don't think of, of, of smoked whiskey with, with uh, lighter colored dessert wines, golden, mm -hmm. you know, all that raisins and all that stuff. I mean, to me, it's just a no brainer. Um, what a great combination. So, I mean, yeah, I don't know. It's, it seems, it seems like a fit made in heaven. And I can't, I don't know why more people haven't done it. Yeah, no, it's amazing. Got it. Great. Thanks. So we're, we're getting close here to nine o'clock. I don't see anybody else with a hand raised. Does anybody else have any questions? Ariel Eisenberg, I'm, I'm just curious. You know, it's like, are, are you okay? Because you haven't asked a question tonight. So my question is, why are you drinking out of plastic cups, dude? Oh, because I'm not at home. Okay. I'm not at home. I'm at, I'm at a friend's house out of town. And the friend uh, is not in his house. And he actually has locked all of his cabinets. He's a good, smart man. Well, you know, he has, well, he has kids. He has young kids. And for those of you who know, I'm actually at the house of uh, Rabbi Abe Friedman. Uh, Abe is out of town, but I'm, uh, he's letting me use his house for, for a few days while I'm in Philadelphia. And all of his cabinets are locked. And I realized that I don't have any glasses. So I actually went to, you know, <laughs> I went to a Wawa here in Philly <laughs> and I bought some plastic cups. So if, if that's your question, I love how uh, observant you are tonight, Ariel. That, that, that is wonderful and that is hilarious. All right. So here's what we're going to do right now. Um, everybody, if you could do me a favor, please if you could pour yourselves another hey, dram if you're so question. inclined eric if you oh wait lynn you had a question yes i didn't see you raise your hand well i wrote it in the chat i missed it ask I your question tell me tell me about your still is it pot is it column or is it a hybrid and if so why is it what it is okay that's actually a pretty decent uh story we it's a pot it's a pot it's forsyth pretty straightforward um and 
they won't let you actually make, they won't make <laughs> two stills the same. So they'll show you a whole catalog of all the stuff they've ever done and for who, and then tell you that you can't have it, um, which is pretty oh. cool. So we looked at uh, some of our some of our heroes. Uh, Glenn Farkless has always been a big inspiration to me. Um, so some some of the bottom shape of this still is a little bit inspired by by their proportions and shape. Um, but the biggest thing about our stills was that we made our we made stills that we used at our original distillery, and they were uh, maybe a little bit odd. And so when we're trying to move to a big, you know, ten times bigger still, and we're asking Forsyth, hey. We know d dimensions and proportions and physics really matter and affect the, 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 the house profile. So we had them look at the stuff we had made ourselves that we'd been using for years. How do we scale this up? And so our line arm had a slight incline. Our old building was a single pitch roof. So our, our building at our old distillery was like this and the stills were over here and then the line arm went up and then the condensers were here because everything had to go with gravity. So the bottom of the condenser was already defined so that the pipes could go around and go to the, go to the uh, receivers. And that's not super common to have a linear, like about a four to five degree incline on your line arm and somewhat long. Our, 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 you know, our stills were like six feet across and the line arms were like 17 feet long. Um, so we have really unique stills. The, the spirit side, the, when, the, when the, the line arm comes off the swan neck, it, it actually spirals around so that they can get that incline and that distance um, in the same kind of footprint in the building. Um, I don't have a picture. I could pull it up. Maybe Alex has got a, something he can throw up on his screen real quick. Um, but um, yeah, they're pretty unique. And it was mostly because they were trying to solve for um, giving us a prof. There, there you go. So that's, that's right on top of our still. And that's, that's all coiling up before it goes into the condenser. Um, so we do get a little more rectification. We got a ton of copper contact, so we don't get a ton of sulfur. They're not meaty in like the Mortlock, uh, warm tub sense. Um, and we also have two different ones. So our first one that we put in is those are six inch diameter uh, coils. And the second set we put in are eight inch and there's only four rotations instead of 10. So we can run this, the second still set a little bit harder and get something that's a little fainter and a little fattier. Um, and get less less uh, reflux on it. And the other one can make stuff that's really kind of dialed in and tight. Um, yeah. Wow. That's our stills. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, also found out when the Forsyth guys were here, our condensers are really big. And I said, hey, man, those condensers sure are big. Why did you make them so big? And I was expecting some really cool like heat exchange calculations and physics and um, stuff. And they said, oh, you had a really big room. So... Uh, those stills are about four stories tall. And I don't know that they're the tallest pot stills they've ever made, but I know, we all know some brands in Scotland that like to talk about how tall their stills are and how they're the tallest in Scotland. And these are definitely taller than that. But once again, apparently it's just because we had the space. So, said, what, so what would the length be if you uncoiled that whole oh, yeah. assembly up there? I mean, it'd be hundreds of feet, I would think. It's well, a lot. Everything's bigger in Texas. Right? Everything's in bigger Texas in comes Texas. Out. That's what it comes back to, <laughs> and, all right? And I was like, man, next time I order something from you guys, don't just fill up the space because you may or not may or not be aware, but copper is not cheap, you know. And I'm sure they have a markup too on their on their costs. So, no, but they've been great. We love the stills. They give us a lot of flexibility, and they're definitely unique. And there's not really anything else out out, out there like it. So. That was a great question, Lynn. Thank, thank you for interrupting yeah. me, Lynn, because that was a great, great question. All right, everybody. So now let, let's go back to the ceremonial part of our evening. Uh, if everybody could please pour yourself another dram if you are so inclined. I am absolutely going back to the peated sauternes cask. That, that is an amazing dram. Uh, everybody, please unmute. I remember you. we can't unmute you, but you can unmute yourselves. Uh, everybody, please unmute. And please join me in saying thank you and cheers to our special guest, Jared Hempstead, and also Alex Elrod. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This was wonderful. Uh, Jared, do you have any final comments for us before we uh, turn off the recording here? Oh, man, no, no prepared statement. I don't have my teleprompter with me, but um, I, I, I do want to reiterate how much the 
the whiskey community in the U.S. has changed in the last decade, and it's 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 legitimately a community, and it's so fun for me. It's been a lot of fun to watch um, kind of some of the barriers removed between um, people making that used to be, you know, 10, 15 years ago, it was a little bit like the Wizard of Oz and the guys behind the curtain, and you're not really sure what's going on back there. Um, and we've, re we've kind of removed a lot of these these levels and a lot of these barriers, and people are having a lot of, like, direct interaction um, and I, I, I think, especially when you're, you know, that the people on the other end of a screen or the people at the other end of a bar, if you're, when we, you know, back when we were actually doing things live, um, are, are people that are excited and driven and uh, about by the same things that, that this is something that's grabbed them, you know, that they feel very strongly about. And it doesn't matter at all if they like your stuff or not. The point is we're both here because we love whiskey. Um, and these things are invigorating, especially, you know, we've all been somewhat isolated for a long time now. So thank you for your energy. It's nice. We, it can, we, it. we, we sit in the blending room and we're running stills and we're tasting samples and, and it, we've had a lot less interaction with people, the end users, if you will, the last two years, year and a half. And uh, so thanks for having us. It's our, nice our to pleasure. Our you know, this is really a blessing for us too, because uh, the technology has allowed us to do this at a time when we were all isolated and it has been Absolutely. incredible for people on our end to get to know people like you. And, you know, you guys have been so generous with your time and your samples Absolutely. and we appreciate it. 